And usually that's one. So if I'm not there yet, add one. If I'm not there yet, add one. And it'll build up slowly. And you, you saw that there where the, it was almost in position to score. And it kind of sat there. And then the motors kind of build up some power and move to the final position that we're only letting it build up slowly. So what's going on here is it's saying, um, this is all the error stuff. We keep track of how long have I been away and how, like adding up how far I've been away every time. So I should probably highlight as I go. Can you kind of try to figure out what I'm doing? Um, so at the very top here, if my error is greater than, we always have an epsilon range around where we finish. If I'm outside that range, I still have farther to go, I need to add more into my sum. Um, this is actually kind of ugly, isn't it? It's fine. It's fine? Okay, so that's what this is here saying. Add more into my, my error sum. Um, we've got an extra clause in here where we, we put like a maximum contribution. So if it's less than the maximum increment, only add in the actual error. So if I'm 23 ticks away and I allow for up to a maximum contribution of 50, well, don't add the whole 50 because I'm not that far away, only add the 23. But if I'm more than 50 away, just add 50. So that's what's going on here. You read the That's what's going on here is that, so if it's less than the error maximum contribution, just add that in, otherwise add in the whole error contribution that we allow. And then we have the exact same thing for the other side. And the one extra thing, I think I should go back up for a second. Sorry, I forgot something. Um, this part here is, let's say I was going towards it, and I actually went past it. We no longer want the eye that's been summing up to keep moving us forward. We want to be going back now. So if I've now gone too far forward, cut out the whole high um, sum, summation that we've been doing. Um, that's pretty much it. So that's the idea of how can you build up an I term without letting it overflow too quickly and take over your system. And we found this work pretty well. You take that and multiply it by your I coefficient and if you go down right to the bottom. Oh, oh yeah, there. Actually, here it is. My output is my P value plus my I value because if I'm a long ways away, I want to go faster. If I've been away for a while, I want to go faster, and then I take away my D part because if I'm going really fast, I want to slow down. And that's kind of PID in five and a half minutes. So what you get with the idea is, uh, Mike talked about the analogy of robot driving, but you noticed that the arm traveled up and then kind of did its thing. There was PID control on the arm, PID control on the core bar. PID allows you to be very, very precise in what you do. Um, you, if you noticed last year, as teams did their autonomous modes and they were doing their turns, you would a lot of times see a team stop and then kind of twitch a bit. That was their PID settling in. If you're going to be really accurate at this game, you need to use PID. Other than the PID can be used for, in 2006, when we had the robot that shot that launched the balls, people often noticed, like, well, we can't push them. Why can't we push them? And a lot of people said, oh, it's because they had tank treads. Yes and no. We also were engaging a PID based law. So, driver would hit a button on his joystick, and if anyone tried to push, the robot would automatically fight back, because the robot was using PID to try and stay at zero movement. So, the driver didn't have to fight back, he just hit his base lock button, other teams would be pushing, and it would naturally fight back. And that's how it managed to stay in one spot when it would shoot the balls in. And what the really neat thing was, that's why that robot didn't need to have a turret, because it knew it was going to stay in the right spot. So, PID is like, uber powerful once you harness it. And <laughs> the joke that we had with AEW was, we, we had a student who just wasn't getting PID, but he did get lunch. <laughs> so we basically said, the P is how far away you are from AEW. And the D is how fast you're going to AEW. And the I is how long it's been since you've been to AEW. <laughs> And it just registered with him. <laughs> and he totally got it, you know. And now, you know. <laughs> the funny thing was, like 30 minutes later, we're like, looking back and explaining the idea. He's like, uh, I want to make W. <laughs> but no, like, it's, it's, it's not that hard to understand as a concept. But what Mike says is, it's really hard to tune. Getting those constants right. And like Sean, you and I have talked about this before. If someone could design an automated PID tuner, you could make a lot of money. A lot of money. Sorry? Yeah, and th there's kind of an order to it. You set everything to zero to start. Um, you up your P until it actually gets to where it should do, and it'll oscillate 
consistently around the end point. If, it, if the oscillations get bigger, then you have too much peak. But once you have it, so it, it gets there and just keeps going back and forth around it, then you start adding in D until it comes and settles without oscillation, and then add in a little bit of Y at the end to actually get it to the right spot. And that's, that's become our formula over the last few years. It's definitely not ideal because we still don't sleep very much during build season, but it's worked fairly effectively. I would not recommend, if this is your first time doing autonomous, having your first autonomous mode have PID control. Start with timer based. Move to sensors and then just stopping and coasting. And then move into PID control. If you try to jump all the way there, you're adding too many different problems into it of sensor integration and finding the right value and ceilings on things and that. So start simple and build up. You've got six weeks to do it plus competitions and that. We did not start in 06.